Much is said of the Wright brothers. Wilbur, 1867-1912, and Orville, 1871-1948, and their first controlled, sustained flight of a powered, heavier-than-air aircraft with the Wright Flyer on December 17, 1903, four miles south of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, as well as their invention in 1904 and 5 of the first practical fixed wing aircraft, the Wright Flyer 3. Although they were not the first to build experimental aircraft, the Wright brothers were the first to invent the three axis aircraft control system that made fixed wing powered flight possible. Their first U.S. patent, U.S. 821393A of May 22, 1906, did not claim to be the first ever invention of a flying machine, but described a three-axis system, pitch, roll, and yaw, of aerodynamic control that manipulated a flying machine's surfaces. Until May 6, 1937, the airplane flying machine was not the main mode of sky travel, and the inventions of the Wright brothers were not as important as they are today. The date, May 6, 1937, was that of the so-called Hindenburg disaster, when the LZ-129 Hindenburg, a large German commercial passenger-carrying rigid airship designed and built by the Zeppelin Company and kept aloft by hydrogen gas and engines running off diesel fuel, exploded and burst into flames, crashing to the ground at 7.25 p.m. local time at Naval Air Station Lakehurst in Manchester Township, New Jersey, United States, killing 36 people, 13 passengers, 22 crewmen, and one worker on the ground. The wreck of the Hindenburg was not the worst of the great airship disasters, others having included the British R-38 in 1921, 44 dead, the U.S. airship Roma in 1922, 34 dead, the French Demu in 1923, 52 dead, the British R-101 in 1930, 48 dead, and the U.S. Akron in 1933, 73 dead. But it was the last, given it was recorded in newsreel coverage, photographs, and Herbert Morrison's instantly famous, Oh, the Humanity, radio eyewitness reports from the landing field. Prior to the Hindenburg disaster, the main mode of air travel was the dirigible balloon, a rigid structure blimp or aerostat, a lighter-than-air aircraft that gains its lift through the use of a buoyant gas. The first theory for such a vessel was the 1670 aerial ship designed by Italian Jesuit priest Francesco Lana de Terzi, 1631-1687, called the father of aeronautics. Considered the earliest vacuum airship, or vacuum balloon, his is a hypothetical balloon airship that uses evacuation of oxygen in its tanks, copper spheres, rather than filling them with a lighter-than-air gas such as hydrogen or helium. 
the first person to use a hand-powered propeller to move a passenger balloon was Jean-Pierre Blanchard, 1753 to 1809, and in 1785 he crossed the English Channel in a balloon equipped with flapping wings for propulsion and a bird-like tail for steering. In 1852, Henry Giffard, 1825 to 1882, became the first person to make an engine-powered flight when he flew 27 kilometers, 17 miles, in a steam-powered airship. On June 1, 1863, Solomon Andrews, 1806 to 1872, flew his Arion design, an unpowered, controllable dirigible, in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. The Arion had three 80-foot-long cigar-shaped balloons with a rudder and gondola, and its buoyancy was controlled by jettisoning sand ballast or releasing hydrogen lift gas. Dr. Andrews wrote Abraham Lincoln later that summer offering the Arion for use in the American Civil War, during which Andrews served for a time as a volunteer surgeon in the Union Army. After much discussion, he arranged a demonstration early in 1864 before the Smithsonian Institution. However, he was informed nearly a year later that the government had little interest in his invention, and by that time the war was nearly over. Undeterred, Andrews organized the Aerial Navigation Company to build commercial airships and establish a regular line between New York and Philadelphia. The Arion II had one lemon-shaped balloon sharply pointed at the ends. It controlled buoyancy with a system of lines and pulleys that compressed the gas or allowed it to expand. It flew over New York City on May 25th and June 5th, 1866. The second trip, carrying a passenger assistant, a news reporter had to be left out at the last minute because of weight problems, ended at Oyster Bay, Long Island. By this point, a race toward the era of great airships had begun. The first fully controllable free flight was made in 1884 by Charles Renard, 1847 to 1905, and Arthur Constantin Krebs, 1850 to 1935 in the French Army airship La France. The 170 foot, 52 meter long, 66,000 cubic feet, 1,900 metric cube airship La France covered 8 kilometers or 5 miles in 23 minutes with the aid of an 8.5 HP 6.3 kilowatt electric motor and a 435 kilogram or 959 pound battery. La France made seven flights in 1884 and 1885 and returned five times of these seven in a round trip back to its starting point. In 1886, inspired by this feat, French futurist author Jules Verne, 1828-1905, penned the work Rober the Conqueror, also called The Clipper of the Clouds, ostensibly chronicling the debate between lighter-than-air dirigibles and heavier-than-air crafts like airplanes and, in this story's case, 
helicopters. The story was cautionary against dirigibles, pointing out their maximum pressure height above which their gas bags rupture, and in favor instead of a battery-powered multi-rotor gyrodyne design essentially a helicopter with multiple vertical air screws to provide lift and two horizontal air screws in a push-pull configuration to drive the vessel forward. Further improvements to dirigible designs were made in 1888 with the Campbell Airship designed by Professor Peter C. Campbell submitted to aeronautic engineer Carl Edgar Myers for examination before being built by the Novelty Airship Company, only to be lost at sea in 1889 while flown by Professor Hogan during an exhibition flight. And beginning in 1888, the three airships powered by a Daimler Motorin Geschelcraft built petrol engine the last of which caught fire in flight and killed both occupants in 1897, built by Friedrich Wolfert. In 1897, an airship with an aluminum envelope was built by the Hungarian-Croatian engineer David Schwartz, 1850-1897, and made its first flight at Tempelhof Field in Berlin after Schwartz had died. From 1897 to 99, Konstantin Danilewski, a medical doctor and inventor from Kharkiv, now Ukraine, then Russian Empire, built four muscle-powered airships of gas volume 150 to 180 cubic meters and conducted an experimental flight program launching around 200 ascents at two locations without significant incident. On November 18, 1896, the Sacramento B and San Francisco Call newspapers reported the first California mystery airship sighting. Witnesses reported a bright light moving slowly over the capital city of Sacramento on the evening of November 17th at an estimated elevation of 1,000 feet. On November 19th, 1896, the Stockton, California newspaper, The Daily Mail, reported that a Colonel H.G. Shaw had found what he believed to have been a landed alien ship. Shaw described the craft as having a metallic surface, completely featureless apart from a rudder and pointed ends. He estimated a diameter of 25 feet and said the vessel was around 150 feet in total length. Three, slender, seven foot tall, 2.1 meter, apparent extraterrestrials were said to approach from the craft while, quote, emitting a strange warbling noise, end quote. The beings reportedly examined Shaw's buggy and then attempted to physically remove him from it to drag him to their ship. When they could not overcome him, the beings returned to their ship and sped off into the sky. Shaw believed the beings were Martians sent to kidnap an earthling for unknowable but potentially nefarious purposes. This is apparently the first published account of explicitly so-called extraterrestrial beings attempting to abduct humans into their spacecraft. On November 21, 1896, the mystery light reappeared over Sacramento and was also reportedly seen over several other cities that same evening 
including San Francisco, Oakland, Folsom, Sebastopol, Modesto, Stockton, Turlock, Manteca, Crow's Landing, Ceres, Woodland, and others, and was said to have been viewed by at least several hundred witnesses. Whether these early UFO sightings are of man-made or alien technology, and whether these early reports were the result of tabloid gossip and rumor reporting, so-called yellow journalism, or possibly a form of mass hysteria, remain unresolved mysteries from this era to the day of this writing. Contemporary to the mystery airship flap of 1896 and 97, German pharmacologist and chemist Arthur Hefter, 1859-1925, isolated the psychoactive ingredient mescaline from the peyote cactus and conducted experiments with it on himself, comparing the effects of natural peyote and purified mescaline. Mescaline occurs in the peyote, San Pedro, and Peruvian torch cacti, and has been used for at least 5,700 years in Native American religious ceremonies, notably by the Huicols in Mexico. Immediately after the Battle of Blythe Road in April, on advice from two unnamed members of S.L. Mather's branch of the Golden Dawn, British ritual magician Aleister Crowley traveled from Paris to Mexico City in late June 1900. Upon arriving in Mexico City, Crowley began an affair with a local woman, climbed Iztacuyotl, Popocatapetl, and Colima Mountains with a fellow alpinist, Anglo-German Oscar Eckenstein, 1859-1921, practiced Enochian ritual magic, wrote a play based on Richard Wagner's Tannhauser, and was conferred the 33rd degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry under the tutelage of one Don Jesus de Medina Sidonia, with whom Crowley also formed a secret society called the Lamp of the Invisible Light. As Crowley discovered upon leaving Mexico in April 1901, the lodge in which Don Jesus had initiated him was, as recalled by Masonic historian brother John Hamill, a minuscule irregular body, which thus granted Crowley no regular Masonic standing. It is not known if it was for the first time there but it is known Crowley was exposed to peyote culture while in Mexico as well. It remains a possibility that the lamp of the invisible light imagined by Crowley and Don Jesus was actually a peyote-based drug cult. Following 1901, Crowley had no further contact with Don Jesus, leaving history to wonder if he ever really existed at all. Again, his year in Mexico City may or may not have been Crowley's first exposure to peyote and its active ingredient mescaline, but it would certainly not be his last. Immediately after returning from his Algerian sojourn with English poet Victor Neuberg, 1883-1940, during which they performed the Enochian Calls of the Ethers, as described in the work The Vision and the Voice, Crowley won a lawsuit filed by S. L. Mathers for Crowley's having published the Second Order Ritual of the Golden Dawn in the March 1910 issue of his periodical The Equinox. 
his victory in court, and attendant publicity, won several converts to his contemporary Argentamastrum secret society. Among these, Australian violinist Leila Waddell, 1880 to 1932, who would become Crowley's lover following Crowley's November 1909 divorce from his first wife, Rose Edith Kelly, 1874 to 1932. In the summer of 1910, Crowley penned the Rites of Artemis, which, later in the year, he expanded into the Rites of Eleusius, a series of seven invocations based on the seven classical planets of antiquity, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sol, Venus, Mercury, and Luna. The rites of Artemis were performed at the Argentum Astrum headquarters, with various members personifying various deities, and the press that attended reported largely positively on it, possibly because attendees were given a fruit punch containing peyote to enhance their experience. When the experiment was repeated without the presence of a mescaline cocktail, in October and November later that year, 1910, as the rites of Eleusius at Caxton Hall, Westminster, London, the results were very much different. The rites were performed by various Argentamastrum members, as mentioned, including Crowley, Leela Waddell, Layla, Victor Neuberg and his lover, Joan Hayes, Jan de Forest, West de Wend Fenton, editor of the Looking Glass newspaper, labeled Crowley one of the most blasphemous and cold-blooded villains of modern times, and insinuated he was in a homosexual relationship with British chemist, former Golden Dawn member, and 1906 co-founder with Crowley of the Argentamastrum, George Cecil Jones, Jr., 1873-1960. In 1911, Jones unsuccessfully attempted to sue the Looking Glass for libel. This scandal cost Crowley his longtime ally, Major General J.F.C. Fuller, 1878-1966, whom had won a 100-pound prize for best essay about Crowley's collected works, entitled The Star in the West, in 1907. It appears possible it was this experiment involving dosing a captive audience with peyote in the rites of Artemis, using a control group who were not exposed to the psychedelic in the rites of Eleusius, that began Aleister Crowley's interest in observing people involuntarily given psychedelics. Immediately after the July 28, 1914 outbreak of the Great War, or the War to End All Wars, now recalled as simply World War I. Crowley sailed to America aboard the RMS Lusitania, leaving Britain on October 24th and arriving in New York, New York on October 31st, 1914. By this point, Crowley's income consisted primarily of donations from Argentamastrum members and dues payments made to the OTO, and in May 1914, he had had to transfer ownership of his manor in Boluskine to the Mysterium Mystica Maxima, the British branch of the OTO. Upon arriving in New York City, he moved into the St. Regis Hotel, among the most expensive in Manhattan, 
and began earning money writing for the American edition of Vanity Fair, undertaking freelance work for the famed astrologer Evangeline Adams, 1868-1932, and selling some rare books to Irish-American lawyer and art collector John Quinn, 1870-1924. Crowley would remain in the United States until December 1919, when, immediately following a climbing holiday in Montauk, New York, he returned to London. From the date of his arrival in 1914 until finally leaving the U.S. in 1919, Crowley was unofficially employed by the British Secret Service, specifically answering to Guy Reginald Arthur Gaunt, 1869 to 1953, British naval attaché in the U.S., under Everard Fielding, 1867 to 1936, and the NID, Naval Intelligence Division, of Admiral W. Reginald Hall. 1870 to 1943, and was serving as a British spy. In January 1915, Crowley authorized Frater Akkad, Charles Stansfield Jones, 1886 to 1950, to found the first MMM branch of the OTO in North America. British Columbia Lodge No. 1. On October 16, 1915, Crowley met with Jones and his fellow Lodge members in Vancouver, including Wilford Talbert Smith, 1885-1957, London dramatist Horace Sheridan Bickers, 1883-1957, and his wife, Margaret Betty Hartnell Bickers. For 13 months, from March 1917 until April 1918, British Columbia Lodge No. 1 was closed following the November 1916 attempted resignations from the OTO of W.T. Smith, Emily Sophia Nem Talbot Smith, and her daughter from a previous relationship, Catherine, while Crowley and Jones investigated their relationships. Jones had also made connections in Detroit, Chicago, and Minneapolis St. Paul, all of which Crowley visited on his 1915 trip to Vancouver. Jones's contact in Detroit was Freemason and proprietor of the Universal Book Company publishing house, Brother Albert W. Ryerson, 32nd degree, whom agreed to publish the March 1919 issue of Crowley's Equinox. In 1918 and 19, Crowley furnished certain information examined by an assistant to the office of the Deputy Attorney General for the State of New York, then prominent Freemason, Brother Alfred Leroy Becker, regarding his espionage activities on behalf of the British Admiralty's NID. Crowley revisited Detroit in April 1919, and again that autumn, not long prior to leaving for Britain in December. Another purpose of these visits to Detroit appears to have been securing a big stash of pharmaceutically refined peyote. From Building 55 Detroit Research, or the Park Davis Research Laboratory. By the time of Crowley's 1919 tour of the facilities there, Park Davis & Co. Pharmaceutical Plant in Detroit, Michigan, covered nearly 14 acres on the Detroit International Riverfront and was home to the world's largest pharmaceutical company of the day.
it is likely owing to the 1911 Official Secrets Act, OSA, Section 2, that Crowley's work, Lieber 934, The Cactus, seems to have vanished. Whether due to being utterly destroyed or merely confiscated and concealed cannot even now be said. Crowley claimed it to have been, quote, compiled from the actual records of some hundreds of experiments, end quote, in which he voluntarily or involuntarily administered varying doses of peyote to dinner guests in a spicy curry recipe and then studied their reactions to it. Perhaps the closest to this work we can come today may be the Amalantra workings of Crowley with Sora Ashita, Roddy Minor, and several others performed in her studio apartment in New York from January 14th until June 16th, 1918. In this working, called Lieber 729, in the Compendium of Complete OTO Works, Minor records repeated interactions with Lamb, whom Crowley considered the soul of a dead llama from Lang, between China and Tibet. Crowley's drawing of Lamb has been identified as a precursor for descriptions by abductees of gray aliens. It was also in 1918 and 19 that Austrian biochemist Ernst Spath first synthesized mescaline from 3,4,5-trimethoxybenzoyl chloride. The psychedelic drug, or entheogen, lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD, was first synthesized on November 16, 1938, by the Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman, 1906 to 2008, in the Sandoz Laboratories in Basel, Switzerland. While researching lysergic acid derivatives, Hoffman first synthesized LSD with the main intention of obtaining a respiratory and circulatory stimulant, an analeptic. The Battle of Los Angeles, also known as the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, occurred less than three months after the United States entered World War II in response to the Japanese Imperial Navy's attack on Pearl Harbor and one day after the bombardment of Elwood near Santa Barbara, California by a Japanese submarine on February 23, 1942. On February 24, naval intelligence issued a warning that an attack could be expected within the next 10 hours. That evening, a large number of flares and blinking lights were reported from the vicinity of defense plants. An alert was called at 7.18 p.m. and was lifted at 10.23 p.m. Soon, however, radars picked up an unidentified target 120 miles west of Los Angeles. Anti-aircraft batteries were alerted at 2.15 a.m. and were put on green alert, ready to fire, a few minutes later. Radars tracked the approaching target to within a few miles off the coast, and at 2.21 a.m., the regional controller ordered a blackout. Air raid sirens sounded at 2.25 a.m. throughout Los Angeles County. A total blackout was ordered, and thousands of air raid wardens were summoned to their positions. At 3.06 a.m., a balloon carrying a red flare was seen over Santa Monica, and four batteries of anti-aircraft artillery opened fire, whereupon 
quote, the air over Los Angeles erupted like a volcano, end quote. At 3.16 a.m., the 37th Coast Artillery Brigade began firing 50 caliber machine guns and 12.8 pound anti-aircraft shells into the air at reported aircraft. Over 1,400 shells would eventually be fired. Several buildings and vehicles were damaged by shell fragments and five civilians died as an indirect result of the anti-aircraft fire. Three killed in car accidents in the ensuing chaos, and two of heart attacks attributed to the stress of the hour-long action. On April 16, 1943, Hoffman decided to take a second look at LSD. While resynthesizing LSD, he accidentally absorbed a small amount of the drug through his fingertips and discovered its powerful effects. On April 19, 1943, Hoffman performed a self-experiment to determine the true effects of LSD, intentionally ingesting 0.25 milligrams, 250 micrograms, of the substance, an amount he predicted to be a threshold dose. An actual threshold dose is 20 micrograms. Less than an hour later, Hoffman experienced sudden and intense changes in perception. He asked his laboratory assistant to escort him home. As was customary in Basel, they made the journey by bicycle. The events of this first LSD trip, now known as Bicycle Day, after the bicycle ride home, proved to Hoffman that he had indeed made a significant discovery. A psychoactive substance with extraordinary potency, capable of causing significant shifts of consciousness in incredibly low doses. Hoffman foresaw the drug as a powerful psychiatric tool. The first UFO sightings of the modern era occurred in November 1944 when pilots flying over Western Europe by night reported seeing fast-moving, round, glowing objects following their aircraft. The objects were variously described as fiery and glowing red, white, or orange. Some pilots described them as resembling Christmas tree lights and reported that they seemed to, to toy with the aircraft making wild turns before simply vanishing. Pilots and air crew reported that the objects flew formation with their aircraft and behaved as if they were under intelligent control, but never displayed hostile behavior. However, they could not be outmaneuvered or shot down. The phenomenon was so widespread that the lights earned a name, in the European theater of operations, they were often called Kraut Fireballs, but for the most part, they were called Foo Fighters. The military took the sightings seriously, suspecting that the mysterious sightings might be secret German weapons. But further investigation revealed that German and Japanese pilots had reported similar sightings. The Balls of Fire phenomenon reported from the Pacific Theater of Operations, differed somewhat from the Foo Fighters reported from Europe. The ball of fire reported there resembled a large burning sphere which just hung in the sky, though it was reported to sometimes follow aircraft. On one occasion, one of the gunners of a B-29 aircraft hit one with gunfire causing it to break up into several large pieces that fell on buildings below and set them on fire. Dr. Bruno Niklos Maria Weber, 1915-1956, was a German physician, bacteriologist, and chief of the Waffen-SS Hygienic Institute in the Central Warehouse 
and in block 10 of Auschwitz I. It is Dr. Weber to whom we ostensibly owe the creation of the term MK, short in German for mind control, for using barbiturates and morphine derivatives for hypnotic suggestion purposes and using psychotropic drugs during interrogations. Weber served at Auschwitz until January 1945 when Soviet troops began approaching from the east at which point Weber was transferred to the Dachau concentration camp. LSD was introduced as a commercial medication under the trade name Delicid for various psychiatric uses in 1947. LSD was brought to the attention of the United States in 1949 by Sandoz Laboratories because they believed LSD might have clinical applications. Project SIGN was an official U.S. government study of unidentified flying objects, UFOs, undertaken by the United States Air Force and active for most of 1948. Project SIGN's final report, called The Estimate of the Situation, and published in early 1949, stated that while some UFOs appeared to represent actual aircraft, there was not enough data to determine their origin. Project Grudge was the short-lived follow-up project by the U.S. Air Force to investigate UFOs. The project formally ended in December 1949, but continued in a minimal capacity until late 1951. Beginning in 1948, and continuing until 1975, the U.S. Army Chemical Corps conducted classified human subject research at the Edgewood Arsenal facility in Maryland. The purpose was to evaluate the impact of low-dose chemical warfare agents on military personnel and to test protective clothing, pharmaceuticals, and vaccines. A small portion of these studies were directed at psychochemical warfare and grouped under the prosaic title of the Medical Research Volunteer Program, 1956 to 1975. The MRVP was also driven by intelligence requirements and the need for new and more effective interrogation techniques. The experiments involved at least 254 chemical substances, but focused mainly on mid-spectrum incapacitants such as LSD, THC derivatives, benzodiazepines, and BZ. Around 7,000 U.S. military personnel and 1,000 civilians were test subjects over almost three decades. Project Bluebird was run by the CIA's Office of Scientific Intelligence and, on August 20, 1951, it commissioned the initiation of Operation Artichoke, the CIA's secret code name for carrying out in-house and overseas experiments using LSD, hypnosis, and total isolation as a form of psychological harassment for special interrogations on human subjects. At first, agents used cocaine, marijuana, heroin, peyote, and mescaline, but they increasingly saw LSD as the most promising drug. Beginning 1952, LSD was increasingly given to unknowing CIA agents to determine the drug's effects on unsuspecting people. One record states an agent was kept on LSD for 77 days. 
the subjects who left this project were fogged with amnesia, resulting in faulty and vague memories of the experience. In an artichoke memo dated January 1952, it is asked, quote, Can we get control of an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will and even against fundamental laws of nature such as self-preservation? End quote. Project Blue Book began in 1952 and a termination order was given for the study in December 1969, with all activity under its auspices officially ceasing in January 1970. Blue Book had two goals, to determine if UFOs were a threat to national security and to scientifically analyze UFO-related data. By the time Project Blue Book ended, it had collected 12,618 UFO reports and concluded that most of them were misidentifications of natural phenomena, clouds, stars, etc., or conventional aircraft. According to the National Reconnaissance Office, a number of the reports could be explained by flights of the formerly secret reconnaissance planes U-2 and A-12. A small percentage of UFO reports remain classified as unexplained. Project MKUltra began on the order of CIA Director Alan Welsh Dulles on April 13, 1953, and used numerous methods to manipulate people's mental states and alter brain functions, including the surreptitious administration of drugs, especially LSD, and other chemicals, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual abuse, and other forms of torture. The scope of Project MKUltra was broad, with research undertaken at 80 institutions, including colleges and universities, hospitals, prisons, and pharmaceutical companies. The CIA operated through these institutions using front organizations, although sometimes top officials at these institutions were aware of the CIA's involvement. The project's intentionally obscure CIA cryptonym is made up of the digraph MK, meaning that the project was sponsored by the agency's technical services staff, followed by the word ULTRA, which had previously been used to designate the most secret classification of World War II intelligence. On September 19, 1961, Around 10.30 p.m., Barney Hill, 1922 to 1969, and his wife Betty Eunice Hill, formerly Betty Barrett, 1919 to 2004, were driving their 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air along U.S. Route 3, just south of Lancaster, back to their home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire after a vacation in Niagara Falls and Montreal. On September 21st, Betty telephoned Peace Air Force Base to report the couple had encountered a UFO. On September 22nd, Major Paul W. Henderson telephoned the Hills for a more detailed interview. Henderson's report 100 Dash one dash sixty one air intelligence information record dated September twenty sixth was forwarded to Project Blue Book with the cause for the sighting ultimately being listed as quote, insufficient data end quote. Innocuously overlooked by Blue Book as it was, this event became the first widely publicized report of an alien abduction in the United States. Project 112 was a biological and chemical weapon experimentation project 
conducted by the United States Department of Defense from 1962 till 1973. The project started under John F. Kennedy's administration and was authorized by his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, as part of a total review of the U.S. military. The name Project 112 refers to this project's number in the 150 project review process authorized by McNamara. Project 112 primarily concerned the use of aerosols to disseminate biological and chemical agents that could produce quote, controlled temporary incapacitation end quote, CTI. At least 50 trials were conducted. Of these, at least 18 tests involved simulants of biological agents, such as BG, and at least 14 involved chemical agents, including sarin and VX, but also tear gas and other simulants. Test sites included Porton Down, UK, Ralston, Canada, and at at least 13 warships. The shipborne trials were collectively known as Shipboard, Hazard, and Defense, or SHAD. The project was coordinated from Desert Test Center, Utah. In 1964, MK Search was the name given to the continuation of the MK Ultra program. The MK Search program was divided into two sub projects, dubbed MK Often and MK Chickway. Funding for MK Search commenced in 1965 and ended in 1971. The operation was a joint project between the U.S. Army Chemical Corps and the CIA's Office of Research and Development to find new, offensive use agents, with a focus on incapacitating agents. Its purpose was to develop, test, and evaluate capabilities in the covert use of biological, chemical, and radiological material systems and techniques of producing predictable human behavioral and or physiological changes in support of highly sensitive operational requirements. MK often was to deal with testing and toxicological transmissivity of behavioral effects of drugs in animals and ultimately humans. MK Chickwit was concerned with acquiring information on new drug developments in Europe and Asia and with acquiring samples. Most MK Ultra records were destroyed in 1973 by order of then CIA director Richard Helms, so it has been difficult for investigators to gain a complete understanding of the more than 150 funded research subprojects sponsored by MK Ultra and related CIA programs. For example, subproject 54 was the Navy's top secret perfect concussion program which was supposed to use sub-oral frequency blasts to erase memory. According to a footnote, later expunged, from Aleister Crowley's autobiography, Confessions, he identifies Bell Green as, quote, one of the first people I met in New York, end quote, having arrived in 1914. In his magical diary from May 31, 1920, Crowley also lists Bell Green as a sex partner. Belle de Costa Green, 1883-1950, to 1950, 
was the personal librarian of J.P. Morgan, 1837 to 1913, then of his son, Jack Morgan, 1867 to 1943, and when the private collection was incorporated by the New York State Library for public use, the Board of Trustees voted to keep her on as the first director of the Pierpont Morgan Library and Museum, Madison Avenue, Manhattan, New York. Green was also acting as an intelligence operative on behalf of the Morgans while interacting with Crowley, and it is likely that Crowley himself knew this. Thus, theirs was a tryst among spies, and this much is admitted in Crowley's deleted autobiographical footnote. In this note, he records a peculiar proposition he made to Green. Quote, I should pose as an eccentric philanthropist of great wealth and collect indigent persons to found a new colony. End quote. Next, these volunteers would board a chartered ship. Once safely at sea, the colonists would transfer to waiting British warships and quietly land in some secret place. In the meantime, the Royal Navy, using a captured German submarine, would torpedo the colonists' vessel and send it, and to all appearances, its helpless passengers, to the bottom. The last step would be sinking the guilty sub, quote, in very shallow water on the American coast, so that the evidence of the German crime would be obvious. The passengers being American, he added, the operation would have peeved the USA. End quote. The sinking of the Cunard Ocean Liner, RMS Lusitania, occurred on Friday, 7th of May, 1915, during the First World War, as Germany waged submarine warfare against the United Kingdom, which had implemented a naval blockade of Germany. The ship was identified and torpedoed by the German U-boat, U-20, and sank in 18 minutes. The vessel went down 11 miles, 18 kilometers, off the old head of Kinsale, Ireland, killing 1,198 and leaving 761 survivors. The sinking turned public opinion in many countries against Germany contributed to the American entry into World War I, and became an iconic symbol in military recruiting campaigns of why the war was being fought. Argument over whether the ship was a legitimate military target raged back and forth throughout the war as both sides made misleading claims about the ship. At the time she was sunk, she was carrying over four million rounds of small arms ammunition, .303 caliber, almost 5,000 shrapnel shell casings for a total of some 50 tons, and 3,240 brass percussion fuses, in addition to 1,266 passengers and a crew of 696. The Reichstag fire was an arson attack on the Reichstag building, home of the German parliament in Berlin 
on Monday, February 27th, 1933, precisely four weeks after Adolf Hitler was sworn in as Chancellor of Germany. Hitler's government stated that Marinus van der Lubbe, a Dutch council communist, was found near the building, and they attributed the fire to communist agitators in general, though a German court decided later that year that van der Lubbe had acted alone, as he claimed. The first report of the fire came shortly after 2100, when a Berlin fire station received an alarm call. By the time police and firefighters arrived, the main chamber of deputies was engulfed in flames. The police conducted a thorough search inside the building and found van der Lubbe. He was arrested, as were four communist leaders soon after. In February 1933, Bulgarians Georgi Dmitriev, Vasil Tanev, and Blagoy Popov were arrested, and they played pivotal roles during the Leipzig trial, known also as the Reichstag fire trial. They were known to the Prussian police as senior common turn operatives but the police had no idea how senior they were. Dimitrov was head of all common turn operations in Western Europe. Historians disagree as to whether van der Lubbe acted alone, as he said, to protest the condition of the German working class. The Nazis accused the common term of the act some historians endorse the theory proposed by the Communist Party that the arson was planned and ordered by the Nazis as a false flag operation. The term Reichstag fire has come to refer to false flag actions facilitated by an authority to promote their own interests through popular approval of retribution or retraction of civil rights. After the fire, the Reichstag fire decree was passed. The Nazi party used the fire as a pretext that communists were plotting against the German government, and the event is considered pivotal in the establishment of Nazi Germany. Hitler urged President Paul von Hindenburg to pass an emergency decree to suspend civil liberties and pursue a ruthless confrontation with the Communist Party of Germany. After passing the decree, the government instituted mass arrests of communists, including all of the Communist Party parliamentary delegates. With their bitter rivals, the communists gone, and their seats empty, the Nazi Party went from being a plurality party to the majority thus enabling Hitler to consolidate his power. The Decree of the Reich President for the Protection of People and State, or simply the Reichstag Fire Decree, was issued by German President Paul von Hindenburg on the advice of Chancellor Adolf Hitler on 28th February 1933, in immediate response to the Reichstag fire. The decree nullified many of the key civil liberties of German citizens. With Nazis in powerful positions in the German government, the decree was used as the legal basis for the imprisonment of anyone considered to be opponents of the Nazis, as well as for suppressing publications not considered friendly to the Nazi cause. The decree is considered by historians as one of the key steps in the establishment of a one-party Nazi state in Germany. An excerpt from the document, translated, reads, quote, Order of the Reich President for the Protection of People and State. 
on the basis of Article 48, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution of the German Reich. The following is ordered in defense against communist state-endangering acts of violence. 1. Articles 114, 115, 117, 118, 123, 124, and 153 of the Constitution of the German Reich are suspended until further notice. It is therefore permissible to restrict the rights of personal freedom, habeas corpus, freedom of opinion and expression, including the freedom of the press, the freedom to organize and assemble, the privacy of postal, telegraphic, and telephonic communications, warrants for house searches, orders for confiscations, as well as restrictions on property, are also permissible beyond the legal limits otherwise prescribed. The Bay of Pigs was the location of a failed military invasion of Cuba, undertaken by CIA-sponsored paramilitary group Brigade 2506 on April 17, 1961. A counter-revolutionary military group, made up of mostly Cuban exiles who had traveled to the United States after Castro's takeover, but also some U.S. military personnel trained and funded by the CIA. Brigade 2506 fronted the armed wing of the Democratic Revolutionary Front, DRF, and intended to overthrow the increasingly communist government of Fidel Castro. Over 1,400 paramilitaries divided into five infantry battalions and one paratrooper battalion, assembled in Guatemala before setting out for Cuba by boat on April 13, 1961. Two days later, on April 15, eight CIA-supplied B-26 bombers attacked Cuban airfields and then returned to the U.S., on the night of April 16th, the main invasion landed at a beach named Playa Giron in the Bay of Pigs. It initially overwhelmed the local revolutionary militia. The Cuban army's counteroffensive was led by Jose Ramon Fernandez before Castro decided to take personal control of the operation. As the U.S. involvement became apparent to the world, and with the initiative turning against the invasion, Kennedy decided against providing further air cover. As a result, the operation only had half the forces the CIA had deemed necessary. The original plan, devised during Eisenhower's presidency, had required both air and naval support. On April 20th, the invaders surrendered after only three days, with the majority being publicly interrogated and put into Cuban prisons. Operation Northwoods was a proposed, and almost implemented, false flag operation against the Cuban government that originated within the U.S. Department of Defense, DOD and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, JCS, of the United States government in 1962. The proposals called for the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, or other U.S. government operatives to commit acts of terrorism against American civilians and military targets, blaming these on the Cuban government and using this to justify a war against Cuba. The plans detailed in the document included the possible assassination of Cuban emigres, sinking boats of Cuban refugees on the high seas, hijacking planes, 
blowing up a U.S. ship, and orchestrating violent terrorism in U.S. cities. Operation Northwood's proposals recommended hijackings and bombings, followed by the introduction of phony evidence that would implicate the Cuban government. It stated, quote, The desired resultant from the execution of this plan would be to place the United States in the apparent position of suffering defensible grievances from a rash and irresponsible government of Cuba and to develop an international image of a Cuban threat to peace in the Western Hemisphere. End quote. Several other proposals were included within Operation Northwoods, including real or simulated actions against various U.S. military and civilian targets. The operation recommended developing a, quote, communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington, end quote. The plan was drafted by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, signed by Chairman Lehman Lemnitzer, and sent to the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, but was rejected by John F. Kennedy. Following presentation of the Northwoods plan, Kennedy removed Lemnitzer as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, although he later appointed him Supreme Allied Commander of NATO in January 1963. U.S. military leaders began to perceive Kennedy as going soft on Cuba, and the president became increasingly unpopular with the military, a rift that came to a head during Kennedy's disagreements with the service chiefs over the Cuban Missile Crisis. John Fitzgerald Jack Kennedy, born May 29, 1917, commonly referred to by his initials as just JFK, the 35th President of the United States of America, was assassinated on November 22, 1963, at 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time in Dallas, Texas, while riding in a presidential motorcade through Dealey Plaza. Kennedy was riding with his wife Jacqueline, Texas Governor John Connolly, and Connolly's wife Nellie, when he was fatally shot, according to the Warren Commission report, by former U.S. Marine Lee Harvey Oswald, firing in ambush from a nearby building. Governor Connolly was seriously wounded in the attack. The motorcade rushed to Parkland Memorial Hospital, where President Kennedy was pronounced dead about 30 minutes after the shooting. Connolly recovered from his injuries. Oswald was arrested by the Dallas Police Department 70 minutes after the initial shooting. Oswald was charged under Texas state law with the murder of Kennedy, as well as that of Dallas policeman J.D. Tippett, who had been fatally shot a short time after the assassination. At 11.21 a.m., November 24, 1963, as live television cameras were covering his transfer from the city jail to the county jail, Oswald was fatally shot in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters by Dallas nightclub operator Jack Ruby. Oswald was taken to Parkland Memorial Hospital, where he soon died. Ruby was convicted of Oswald's murder, though it was later overturned on appeal and Ruby died in prison in 1967 while awaiting a new trial. After a ten-month investigation, the Warren Commission concluded in 1964 that Oswald assassinated Kennedy, that Oswald had acted entirely alone, and that Ruby had acted alone in killing Oswald. Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson automatically assumed the presidency, 
upon Kennedy's death. The Gulf of Tonkin Incident, also known as the USS Maddox Incident, was an international confrontation that led to the United States engaging more directly in the Vietnam War. It involved either one or two separate confrontations involving North Vietnam and the United States in the waters of the Gulf of Tonkin. The original American report blamed North Vietnam for both incidents, but eventually became very controversial with widespread belief that at least one and possibly both incidents were false, and possibly deliberately so. On August 2, 1964, the destroyer USS Maddox, while performing a signals intelligence patrol as part of DeSoto operations, was pursued by three North Vietnamese Navy torpedo boats of the 135th Torpedo Squadron. Maddox fired three warning shots, and the North Vietnamese boats then attacked with torpedoes and machine gun fire. Maddox expended over 280 3 inch, 76.2 millimeter, and 5 inch, 127 millimeter shells in a sea battle. One U.S. aircraft was damaged, three North Vietnamese torpedo boats were damaged, and four North Vietnamese sailors were killed, with six more wounded. There were no U.S. casualties. Maddox was, quote, unscathed except for a single bullet hole from a Vietnamese machine gun round, end quote. It was originally claimed by the National Security Agency, NSA, that a second Gulf of Tonkin incident occurred on August 4, 1964, as another sea battle, but instead evidence was found of, quote, Tonkin ghosts, unquote, false radar images, and not actual North Vietnamese torpedo boats. The outcome of these two incidents was the passage by Congress of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which granted President Lyndon B. Johnson the authority to assist any Southeast Asian country whose government was considered to be jeopardized by, quote, communist aggression, end quote. The resolution served as Johnson's legal justification for deploying U.S. conventional forces and the commencement of open warfare against North Vietnam. The Project for the New American Century, PNAC, was a neoconservative think tank based in Washington, D.C., that focused on United States foreign policy. PNAC's stated goal was to promote American global leadership. The organization stated that American leadership is good both for America and for the world and sought to build support for a Reaganite policy of military strength and moral clarity. Of the 25 people who signed PNAC's founding statements of principles, 10 went on to serve in the administration of U.S. President George W. Bush, including Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and Paul Wolfowitz. One of the PNAC's most influential publications was a 90-page report titled Rebuilding America's Defenses, Strategies, Forces, and Resources for a New Century. Citing the PNAC's 1997 Statement of Principles, Rebuilding America's Defenses, asserted that the United States should seek to preserve and extend its position of global leadership by 
maintaining the preeminence of U.S. military forces. A section of Rebuilding America's Defenses entitled Creating Tomorrow's Dominant Force became the subject of considerable controversy. Quote, Further, the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. End quote. On the morning of Tuesday, September 11, 2001, four coordinated terrorist attacks killed 2,996 people, injured over 6,000 others, and caused at least $10 billion in infrastructure and property damage. Four passenger airliners, operated by two major U.S. passenger air carriers, United Airlines and American Airlines, all of which departed from airports in the northeastern United States bound for California, were hijacked by 19 terrorists. Two of the planes, American Airlines Flight 11 and United Airlines Flight 175, were crashed into the north and south towers, respectively, of the World Trade Center complex in Lower Manhattan. Within an hour and 42 minutes, both 110-story towers collapsed. Debris and the resulting fires caused a partial or complete collapse of all other buildings in the World Trade Center complex, including the 47-story World Trade Center Tower 7, as well as significant damage to 10 other large surrounding structures. A third plane, American Airlines Flight 77, was crashed into the Pentagon, the headquarters of the U.S. Department of Defense, in Arlington County, Virginia, which led to a partial collapse of the building's west side. The fourth plane, United Airlines Flight 93, was initially flown toward Washington, D.C., but crashed into a field in Stony Creek Township, near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, after its passengers allegedly thwarted the hijackers. Suspicion quickly fell on Al-Qaeda. The United States responded by launching the War on Terror and invading Afghanistan to depose the Taliban, which had failed to comply with U.S. demands to extradite Osama bin Laden and expel al-Qaeda from Afghanistan. Many countries strengthened their anti-terrorism legislation and expanded the powers of law enforcement and intelligence agencies to prevent terrorist attacks. The USA Patriot Act, commonly known as the Patriot Act, is an act of the U.S. Congress that was signed into law by President George W. Bush on October 26, 2001. The title of the act is a contrived three-letter initialism, USA, preceding a seven-letter acronym, PATRIOT, which in combination stand for uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism act of 2001. In response to the September 11th attacks and the 2001 anthrax attacks, Congress swiftly passed legislation to strengthen national security. On October 23, 2001, Republican Representative Jim Sensenbrenner introduced H.R. 3162, incorporating provisions from a previously sponsored House bill 
and a Senate bill also introduced earlier in the month. The next day, the Act passed the House by a vote of 357 to 66, with Democrats comprising the overwhelming portion of dissent. The three Republicans voting no were Robert Ney of Ohio, Butch Otter of Idaho, and Ron Paul of Texas. On October 25th, the Act passed the Senate by a 98 to 1 vote, the only dissent being Russ Feingold of Wisconsin. Those opposing the law have criticized its authorization of indefinite detentions of immigrants. The permission given to law enforcement to search a home or business without the owner's or the occupant's consent or knowledge. The expanded use of national security letters, which allows the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, to search telephone, email, and financial records without a court order and the expanded access of law enforcement agencies to business records, including library and financial records. Since its passage, several legal challenges have been brought against the Act, and federal courts have ruled that a number of provisions are unconstitutional. Many of the Act's provisions were to sunset beginning December 31, 2005, approximately four years after its passage. In the months preceding the sunset date, supporters of the Act pushed to make its sunsetting provisions permanent, while critics sought to revise various sections to enhance civil liberty protections. In July 2005, the U.S. Senate passed a reauthorization bill with substantial changes to several of the Act's sections. While the House Reauthorization Bill kept most of the Act's original language, the two bills were then reconciled in a conference committee, criticized by senators from both the Republican and Democratic parties for ignoring civil liberty concerns. The bill, which removed most of the changes from the Senate version, passed Congress on March 2, 2006, and was signed by President Bush on March 9th and 10th of that year. On May 26, 2011, President Barack Obama signed the Patriot Sunsets Extension Act of 2011, a four-year extension of three key provisions in the Act, roving wiretaps, searches of business records, and conducting surveillance of, quote, lone wolves, or individuals suspected of terrorist-related activities not linked to terrorist groups. Following a lack of congressional approval, parts of the Patriot Act expired on June 1, 2015. With passing the USA Freedom Act on June 2, 2015, the expired parts were restored and renewed through 2019. However, Section 215 of the law was amended to stop the National Security Agency, NSA, from continuing its mass phone data collection program. Instead, phone companies will retain the data and the NSA can obtain information about targeted individuals with permission from a federal court.